Hello everybody, welcome to our small discussion on two of our main domains, the bacteria, sometimes referred to as the oobacteria, bacteria, and the domain archaea. This is a small lecture given in regards to our series on flipped classroom sessions. So this is a, a slight introduction to these two groups. Bear in mind, please make sure that you read not only what's in your textbook, always do your background readings, but also the full lecture I have online. I'll be referencing that exam for the work that we'll be doing in regards to the paper, as well as for your exam itself. So please make sure that you ask any questions you might have on it. For this end, this is just meant to be an introduction to these two groups. I know that a lot of people kind of grumble at bacteria, and we don't think about it much. Maybe when we get sick, for example, oh my gosh, I got another bacterial infection. You know, it's, it's tough to deal with. You have to go to the doctor, maybe get some medicines, hope your immune system can handle it. So we kind of grumble when they get us sick. Maybe you have uh, some uncooked meat and you get a, an E. coli infection, something like this, it causes you to get sick. Not very much fun, but people stop and forget about the fact that bacteria are actually very useful to us. That bacteria, like the fungi, actually have one primary job on the planet, and that's decomposition. So with that, it's a very important role. And then there's also, of course, bacteria that help us out. <clears throat> you have bacteria that live in you, and these bacteria obviously help you. Uh, e. coli, again, if it's found in the right place in the intestinal tract, can actually help to produce out vitamin K. Bear in mind that's not vitamin D, but vitamin K. And therefore, actually is a mutualist in you. In this case, helping you, and it gets helped as well. And then, of course, there are bacteria that causes uh, pathogenic issues and they therefore need to be to be tended to. But bacteria are actually quite amazing organisms. They're very proliferate. There's a lot of bacteria types out there. <clears throat> it used to be, of course, in the Kingdom Monera, and as we've talked about before, the Kingdom Monera is now defunct. That used to be your prokaryote, and some included the viruses as well. And that doesn't work out very well, so that's been disbanded, and now, of course, as I noted, the bacteria and the archaea have been bumped up to domains, and viruses kind of put out into virus world. <clears throat> but prokaryotes though themselves, as noted, can be found just about anywhere. It can be found in very cold environments, very salty environments, very warm environments, places certainly that you and I may not find very habitable. The archaea, for example, are also known as extremophiles, so they're definitely found in places that would not be hospitable perhaps to you and I. And with that, their numbers are absolutely amazing, absolutely amazing. Uh, Campbell does note that there are probably more bacteria in a handful of soil than all of humans on the planet. And that's just a handful of soil. It's really quite, quite incredible. So we get these wonderful views that, you know, I, I take a shower, I'm all nice and clean, but don't really have an idea that you're clean. You're still kind of inundated with this anywhere that you go. It's just amazing not only how, again, proliferate they are, but how successful they are. There's many more types of bacteria, for example, even before the archaea, than even animalia. It's really quite impressive. And then I guess some that say, well, you know, bacteria are pretty simplistic organisms. And in a way, yeah, I mean, there's not a lot of stuff dangling off them, perhaps. But they do indeed have a lot of complexity, say, in their biochemistry. These organisms become very well adapted, just as much so as any other organism. They adapt, for example, they evolve. They can uh, cause some grief in medical science by how fast they can evolve. It's really quite a number. And this is right. They're, they're there. There's a lot of them. We can't see them, perhaps. Um, microscope's obviously quite necessary, as we've seen in lab. Going up to oil immersion is often not a bad idea with these guys, but they are a lot there, and they, they can change fairly rapidly. You know, these guys can, of course, reproduce rather quickly. There you go, there's that numbering that we have in soils. It's really just amazing uh, how, back, how many bacteria out, are there out there and what they can do for us. <clears throat> now, as we discussed, you start talking about formation of the planet. <clears throat> this is a good, say, 4.6 billion years old. And with that, as the planet begins to cool down, again, remember that around maybe, say, 3.8 billion years ago, you start getting sort of water formation on the surface of the planet around that time. Yes. And then perhaps approximately 3.5 billion years ago, life first starts to appear. Whether or not that life might have originated on this planet, which of course is a whole other discussion, and then the purviewing of, of course, astrobiology, astrochemistry, and astrophysics works. But still bacteria and things like that, the prokaryote are beginning to show up about that time. And as we discussed, it's a long time after that, that say, the eukarya begin to make their appearances. So this is very much true that it was probably the first organisms here. Did they come from this planet? Of course, we don't know. And that's going to be part of the basing of your first flipped classroom paper, dealing with one of these astrobiological discussions. It's really quite fascinating. Most of these guys are unicellular, of course. Quite a few of them might form, say, colony types. Some of them can at least form colony types. It's kind of a neat, I, I noted this one being uh, magnetosomes, having these magnetic crystals in them. Of course, we see that in some eukaryotes as well, these 
biomagnets might be found there. So it's really quite amazing the complexity that's there. They are indeed tiny, not like virus tiny, mind you, but certainly they are quite small. You can see they get down to 0.5 microns. It's really quite, quite small. Definitely not like the eukaryotic cells that we typically see out there. But they're, they're quite amazing. They're, they're complex in their biochemistry, as opposed to necessarily like eukaryotes have a lot of stuff dangling off of them, something like that. And with their shaping, they have three common shapes. You should know them, of course, by their common names as well as their more like sciencey names. Spheres, easy enough to envision that, known as cocci. Be aware, of course, that cocci is plural. Cocos is singular. The rods, bacilli is also plural, but you have the singular here of bacillus. And then, of course, these spirals are out there as well. And these shapes are very descriptive. You can easily see here the spherical rod shape actually looks rod. That's kind of nice. And spiral actually looks spiral. And again, getting an idea of sizing the micron issue here. They're, again, quite small. And we've seen this in lab as well. We've had examples for you of very spherical and at least rod shaped bacteria for you to see. In regards to their structure, again, the biochemistry is what I really like to focus in on. Maybe not in this lecture, but in regards to just how complex, again, these organisms can be. And one of the ways we track very general lineages would be whether or not they're gram-positive or gram-negative bacteria. It's a way that very quickly, perhaps in medical science, you get an idea, we'll track medicine this way or track medicine that way, this kind of idea. It's not specific, of course. You can't say, oh, your bacterium is this, based on being gram-positive or negative, but at least gives you a general idea. So with that, we're looking at something like the cell membrane system. And you can see here the walls and then the cell membrane underneath are very particular in their makeup, having this very unique compound called peptidoglycan that can be found there. And this is indeed a, a sugar polymer network. It's really quite an impressive network. And based on the kind of peptidoglycan layer, is it a thick layer, is it a thin layer? Do you have a single cell membrane or two layers of cell membranes? It really gives you an idea of whether or not it is gram positive or negative. And then of course, what it might be susceptible to in regards to staining perhaps, and again, potential medicines that might be out there. And you can easily see, of course, gram positives have this simpler cell walling system, but then a whole lot of the peptidoglycan. It's kind of a thick layer that kind of lies on top of uh, the simpler walling system. And then the gram negative have a little bit less of the peptidoglycan, and it's a bit like a sandwiching material that you see. And you can kind of see that here. In this case, gram positive, you can see it's a rather thick peptidoglycan layer, and then the, the plasma membrane underneath that. But in regards to the gram negatives, you actually see this like sandwiching that I was noting to you, having these two cell walling or cell membrane issues, of course, and then the peptidoglycan in between that, making up its particular version of a cell wall, where this one is a little bit different having the cell wall on top. And if you look closely, perhaps a bit small here, but maybe in your textbooks, you can easily see that the gram positives take this bit of purposing color when it's stained, of course, with crystal violet. And then, of course, the gram negative take a bit of a pinkish stain when they die out with the reds. So it's just kind of unique how it stains. And again, you might be able to track one way or the other based on whether it's a gram positive or a gram negative structure. But depending on the bacterium, there could be a lot of different structuring systems there. This is kind of a nice thing, the fimbriae, having these like projections that are found out, allowing them to kind of stick onto structure, to surface, if you will. And that's kind of nice for them, allowing them to be with individuals or colonies is, is kind of unique. And then another kind of variant of these are the sex pili. And it really is what that sounds like. You can have these bridges that form between bacteria, allowing them to connect and for you to get this like one-way transfer of DNA from a donor bacterium down to a recipient bacterium. So you see, again, different structures forming in these guys that perhaps not as simple, again, as people give them credit for. So we also have other structuring here. This is the in this particular case, the flagella that can be found on bacteria, again, used for what we see in the eukarya locomotion. But here, we have to understand that the development, the evolutionary development of the bacterial flagellum is not quite the same as the eukaryotic flagellum. It's a little bit different. Uh, bear in mind, with the eukaryotic one, we're still talking about, say, the centrioles going up to the cell membrane, bonding to it, becoming that basal body, and having that cilium or flagellum grow out of that. And don't forget, of course, your 9 plus 3 and the 9 plus 2 microtubule arrangements that can be found in these various structures. But we're not seeing that here. This is an entirely different setup in that regard, even though the overall function is the same, locomotion. So again, make sure you separate out your eukarya from your, your prokarya structures. But these guys have three main parts. You can see them there, the motor, hook, and filament. And it really is just that, a system to help get the stuff going, your motor. Hooks are just that. It kind of embeds into the system, like near the plasma membrane. And then the filament itself would be like that hair that comes out, if you will. 
but it allows them to do sort of the same thing as you carry again, be able to move around. And you can see that these actually evolved from other proteins that were there. And we've seen that before. We have a structure that was initially designed for one task, but gets sort of co-opted to do another task. And of course, that's an exaptation that's occurring in these, in these kind of situations. You can see that word right here, an exaptation. And we've seen that before in other contexts, these evolutionary contexts. And here it is coming up again. And like we've seen before, bacteria evolve just like anything else. And so there you go, it's kind of scattered about perhaps in some of these. Sometimes the flagellum is a little bit centralized. You have like a little cluster of them and allowing them again to have some locomotion. And we can see this with an artistic rendition here. You can have, again, the motoring system. It's kind of a large structure down here. The, the hooking system, like I said, out near the plasma membrane and then your filament, kind of like hair, but don't, we're not really calling it that, but it's kind of like that you see in eukaryotes, the cilium or flagellum kind of idea. So it's analogous perhaps in function again, but not in its design. And how is this? Absolutely beautiful, of course, being able to actually see a micrograph of that actual structuring system. It's really quite impressive. How, imp how impressive that microscopes have become, how powerful they've become. I, I really do find the technology fascinating. And you can see here, of course, the sizing again. Bear in mind that funny mu symbol was, of course, our 10 to the minus 6, so microns I refer to it as. Same thing as a micrometer. But notice this is nm, so nanometers, 10 to the minus 9th. Very, very small in this regard. And it's, again, perhaps I'm easily impressed, but I find it fascinating that we have technology that allows us to do that. Again, sort of the same idea to rehash the issue of having functionality similar locomotion, but design is, is not the same as eukarya in that regard. But very complex again in their biochemistry, really quite fascinating. Now remember, a lot of standardized exams, for example, you might find, certainly tests by professors, this kind of idea, will ask you to differentiate between the prokarya and the eukarya, and there could be different ways to do that. One of the ways to do that might be, say, to talk about this having a nucleus, not having a nucleus, or they might talk about whether they have membrane-bound organelles or don't have membrane-bound organelles, that kind of idea. And of course, with the prokaryote, you don't have a nucleus. You have what's called a nucleoid region. And with the eukarya, you do. And of course, here, you do not have membrane-bound organelles, although you can argue about the non-membrane, of course, like a ribosome. And you have these, uh, of course, um, organelle issues that could differentiate on that. So you have the non-membranous here and you have the membranous in eukarya. The, the ribosome issue does kind of come up. The ribosomal issue is whether or not the ribosome is a true organelle. And that's not really the purview of this discussion, but some authors do talk about that. And some do feel that it's not an actual true organelle. But these do have them. And so that's one way you could differentiate. Of course, the eukarya having the, the nucleus and membrane-bound organelles, like a mitochondrion and eukaryon. And these guys don't have that. No membranous organelles of any kind and no nuclei. But that being said, they do have compartmentalization that takes place. So they can be complex in that. And you can have various kinds of compartmentalization like this, for example, a respiratory membrane that's compartmentalized, photosynthetic that's compartmentalized, and this sort of, sort of ring a bell, of course, from our discussions of at least in the eukarya side, talking about thylakoid structures. So we're referencing back towards photosynthetic processes. And do bear in mind, of course, there is a bacterium that is photosynthetic, and that's your cyanobacterium. As a note, please don't forget, don't call them blue-green alga, cyanobacterium. So we see this again, uh, complexity here. It's the biochemical complexity that we're seeing here, as opposed to, again, a lot of stuff dangling off. So we do need to make sure that bacteria are given the credit that they deserve in that regard. So as I noted to you, they don't have these membrane-bound organelles, so a nucleus wouldn't be there. The nucleus, of course, has two membranes around it, a double membrane system on the nuclear envelope. But these guys don't have a nucleus. So what they have is this thing called a nucleoid region. And that's just a region where you find the bacterial genetic material. So you're talking about the bacterial chromosome and then, of course, maybe a plasma that might be there as well. There you go, these small ring structures that are found offset to the bacterial chromosome that might be there also. And as we've noted, of course, like in our discussions of mitochondria, where mitochondria, we think, might have come out of the prokaryotic line and it had been at least at one time these free living organisms. So don't forget your endosymbiont hypothesis. They're going to have their own versions of replication and transcription and how they do their, their formation of uh, protein times out. It's a little bit different than what we see in the eukarya line. So a little bit of difference there. But this uniqueness allows us, again, to work with them. Your author is noting antibiotics. That's definitely true, allowing us to maybe design antibiotics that would go after a prokaryote, but wouldn't hurt necessarily the eukaryote, which is very nice, so that when you and I get sick, if we're lucky enough to have a medicine that can deal with the infection we have, that allows us to have a medicine to go after the bacteria, of course, and not maybe hurt us. Really quite useful. 
So here you go, a poor E. coli, this poor little guy has exploded, poor guy. And all that genetic material has come out, it's the chromosomes that come out. And if you look closely, of course, these small ring structures that is with there as well, your author is correctly noting to you that they are indeed plasmids. So you see there's a lot of stuff packed into that E. coli. It's really amazing how much is in there. It's, again, fascinating. And again, quite small. You can see how large in reference to the E. coli this was. But it shows you there is a lot of genetic material that can definitely be there. Now in reproduction, that's just amazing. We talk about humans. Classically, of course, a generation was 20 years. And not so much here. Uh, these guys reproduce really quickly. And they do it, there you go, really quickly, one to three hours. And they do it through a process called binary fission. So they just kind of bought off and bought off and bought off that kind of idea. It's very, very fast. And so you get very, very short generation times. And with that then, when you start talking about potential, potential evolutionary change, I mean, that can be rather rapid, where you see bacteria maybe not doing much for a while, then also they come back and they come back very different. It's just incredible how fast they can do things. And they've actually seen in labs the ability to cause evolutionary events, to see new species kind of forming here. And you can, or at least adaptations forming here. And you can see that within eight years, just a couple years, they're already forming these adaptations. It's very, very fast in that regard. And as I said, these things become very specialized to their environment. They're just as adapted as we, as we are, eukaryotes are. So to give you an idea of that, to just show you how fast bacteria can, can reproduce, here's a short video on that. And it's just amazing how quickly these things go through what they do. Bacteria reproduce very simply and rapidly by doubling their contents and splitting in two. Just one bacterium, dividing every 20 minutes, could produce nearly 5,000 billion billion bacteria in one day. Absolutely incredible how fast that is. Certainly nothing that eukaryotes do. We, we are obviously quite slow, especially our classic generational rate of 20 years or so. Just, just absolutely amazing. Now in regards to that ability to maybe change over time, you can see why, of course, the rapid reproduction. Mutations, of course, remember all of our discussions on mutations? Mutations are just changed to the genetic material itself. So we have you know, frame shift mutations, and we have, of course, neutral mutations, things like this. Uh, some mutations uh, might benefit the species. Other mutations might be deleterious. Some mutations are neither, again, those neutral mutations. Uh, so we've talked about that several times. If it's a front-loading mutation on a codon, that might lead more towards a thing like a frame shift mutation. It might lead to something more hurtful, like a, a functioning protein, losing that shape, the three-dimensional conformation, and becoming something that's non-functional. Whereas a backloading mutation on a codon may not actually lead to that. You still might get a neutral mutation in that regard, so that leads to no effective change in the polypeptide sequence. So bear that in mind. Mutations, then, as I've said before, please don't define them as either good or bad. They're just a change. And with that, then you have to see kind of what the output is. And if it's neutral, again, there may not be any output. And do also remember that mutations, along with things like uh, gene drift, so allelic GIF, might be might be useful because that's some of the raw material that natural selection can kind of deal with, kind of work with. Bearing in mind that natural selection is working what's already in the population so through our discussions of, of how evolution works. And then, of course, mixing of the DNA and getting something new, genetic recombination. Bacteria obviously have ways to do that. And they can do things that eukaryotes only, if I may say, wish they can do. It's really just fascinating how, again, complex this system really is. So there's that binary fission, that little video I just showed you where they divide, 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 divide. I mean, and very quickly that they can do these again. But they are pretty much clones of each other. They're genetically identical. So in that regard, that's not really what we would refer to as anything sexual in this version of sexual, mind you. And with that, the mutation rates are kind of low. But again, if you're talking about very fast generations, quick, 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 where they might have lower mutation rates, there could be some accumulation that might occur there. So this gives the idea of rapid evolution again. Like I said earlier, change over time can be pretty high here. So here are a few ways in which bacteria can actually reproduce. Transformation, and that's just incredible. They come across some DNA that's actually in the environment. They're able to uptake the DNA so it gets through the plasma system and into the bacterium, incorporate it, and use it. Absolutely amazing they can do that. Of course, eukaryotes really can't do that. We can't come across some random piece of genetic material on the table, suck it up, and ooh, look at that, I've got a new ability if I incorporate it into my particular genome. We obviously don't have that ability. Transduction. Now in this case, we're not talking about like vertical gene transfer or anything like that. So here we're talking about bacteriophages. And notice these are typically things like viruses. And what those little buggers are doing, they're actually going on to the bacterium. Here you go, you can see these guys are just like dotting over this poor bacterium, all these bacteriophages. And then what viruses typically do, they punch into the bacterium, drop their genetic cargo. The bacterium at some point, doesn't have to be right away necessarily, but at some point the viral genetic material gets uptaken into the bacterial genetic material. 
and then now you have that mixing, you have technically genetic recombination, and now the bacterium is being told to do something by the viral genetic material. And it's probably going to produce out maybe like new virus in that, that way, bearing in mind the fact that, of course, viruses cannot reproduce. And here you go, a little bit better view. This is actual micrograph of what of these bacteriophages might look like. You see that, that head, which will probably have the genetic material in there, and these coats, and then these, these legs coming down. It's, it's a, kind of a neat spindly looking virus that kind of attaches on, punches into the bacterium, and drops off that genetic cargo. And at some point, makes the bacterium reproduce. And we've noted before that bacteria are being kind of told probably to reproduce new viruses. That viruses, of course, don't have the ability for self-replication. And for us as scientists, not having that ability to self-replicate is, of course, one of the main reasons why we even argue whether or not viruses are alive. And since they, they don't have that ability, a lot of people think they're not living. That is one of the qualifiers for being fully living. So absolutely amazing how these things can do that. Another one, of course, is conjugation. It, it's not sexual reproduction, per se, but it is a way in which the genetic material of one bacterium gets transferred down to another one. So they have this bridge that forms. It's like a little tunnel, if you will. And genetic material will transfer from one bacterium to the other. It's not a two-way transfer, it's a one-way transfer. And in that regard, then the one is a donator. That's the one giving the genetic material. And the one receiving the genetic material would be the recipient in this case. So your author has very kindly given you an example of this thing called the F factor, and here you go. So here, this is the F plus, which is meaning the donor bacterium. And you can see that mating bridge has formed between them. The plasmid of the F plus is going to reproduce. There you go. You can see it reproducing. Part of it breaks off and then begins to go into the recipient bacterium. As it does so, you can see it's beginning to be copied here. Both are now copying. The donor and the recipient are copying. So you can see that here. This one, the plasmid is already done, but this one's continuous copying. And when everything's all said and done, both of these bacteria pretty much have similar set of this plasmid. So they're both F plus now, having received that material. And that land, excuse me, that, that bridge breaks and it's done. That meeting bridge is actually completed. In this case, the HFR, the high frequency recombinant bacterium, sort of the same idea of the chromosome part of it's being duplicated. You can see that here it's being duplicated going down through that bridge into the donor bacterium. The donor bacterium then begins to incorporate part of that material that came into it. It's the homologous gene set that's kind of getting copied over. And that's what you see here. It's been copied in. The part that is not copied in just kind of breaks down and is not used. But still, you've been able to transfer genetic material from one bacterium down to another. Again, many ways that they can do this. So it's really just a, a, quite a, an impressive array of how these organisms do what they do. Now, in regards to nutritional modes, wow, it's like anything under the sun for these guys that they can kind of work with. And it depends on the bacterium. No one, I'm saying, could do everything. But there's a lot of variation out there in the domain itself, the domains themselves. So it's really quite impressive. Notice some of them can get light energy. I did note to you earlier that we do have some photosynthetic bacteria that are out there, cyanobacterium. And some of these guys get them from, from chemistry. So that's down in here, chemoautotroph. The first one obviously would be photoautotrophy. Photo light, autotrophy, you know, feeding yourself, that kind of idea. So cyanobacterium. Chemoautotrophy, chemicals. So in this case, you're going to get your energy sources are coming out of like hydrogen sulfide, that kind of issue, and then you incorporate it in. You might have some like bicarbonates, whatever, that you incorporate. These might be something like hydrothermal vent bacteria, something like that, that, that are doing that processing. And of course, back in the day, we thought there was no like life down there. It's too deep, too cold, too high, high pressure, that kind of idea. And then, of course, to our great amazement back when we created technology to get down there, we found out, wow, look at that, it's teeming with life. So how do you structure these, these trophic systems down there? And of course, we came back to these guys. The bacteria were harnessing all this nutrient coming out of these, these vents that are down there. Not, of course, any magmatic or lava issue, lava being that magma surface that's cooling, but just had all that nutrient kind of bubbling out from these hot vents. And they were harnessing that. And you got these like huge bacterial mats that were forming. And then from that, you actually had the, uh, the other organisms come in, you know, shrimp and crab and, and maybe some like giant worms coming through and begin to structure out this amazing community, but it started with these guys. Photoheterotrophy, light, and then needing organic sources. Uh, and then one not listed here, I do apologize, this is a note from, Cam from Campbell, it wasn't listed in the notes. They do note four mechanisms here, and that's your chemoheterotrophy, and that's organisms like you and I, we're both the source and the fixing material are both organic compounds. So bacteria do a lot of different things here. Where like you and I, we're just the chemoheterotrophs, this kind of idea. So it's, again, pretty impressive. 
How about what you breathe? Of course, you and I, we like to have this lovely mixture in the atmosphere, you know, 78% nitrogen, 21% oxygen, and then some traces through there. So we kind of like that mixture where we're used to it. It's, even though it's not been the relative mixture of gases on the planet throughout Earth's history, obviously, as we've spoken before, that's changed several times and quite a bit. Today, that's what it is. So for us, we like O2. And we like that 21% coming in. And of course, the nitrogen we bring in, the 78% we bring in, and we spit right back out. You know, we don't use that. But bacteria, man, they're kind of impressive. And as I noted to you, some of them are kind of like us. They like oxygen in that regard. So these are the obligate aerobes. Like, we're like that. We have to have oxygen in the system. Some of them don't like oxygen, so they kind of get away from it. And I mentioned there are anoxic areas on the planet before. So like dipping down in the mud, getting down in that area might be a good place to go. So they're the facultative anaerobes. They don't like O2. Uh, excuse me, those are the obligate anaerobes, I apologize. They don't like O2. The facultative guys, they're amazing. These are the ones that O2, okay, I'll use it. No O2, okay, I'll use it, that kind of idea. It's really quite impressive. They might default to the I don't like O2 scenario if they have a preference, you know, not to anthropomorphize them, but if, if they could have one or the other environments. But you know, if O2's there, great, the facultatives can deal with it. So these guys like us like O2, these guys don't like O2. Remember, A or AN in Latin and Greek means without, and these guys, either one, with it, without it, woo, who cares? You know, they can do just fine. Again, impressive abilities where eukaryotes really don't have that. Certainly, we don't have that kind of ability again. Now, symbioses do occur. There are a lot of symbioses out there. So like you and I, we have symbionts in us. You know, we have things that are parasites. We have things that are mutualists, this kind of idea. And these guys are doing the same. We see some, some different areas where bacteria can hurt, yes. I mean, they could be parasitic or in their decomposition process hurt an organism. And then some that are helping out. Even for you, you've got good bacteria that help you out. So with that, you have some examples here of like bacteria helping out with nitrogen. Nitrogen is quite a fascinating one where you have, of course, all that, that nitrogen in the atmosphere. 78% is quite a bit. But not many things can actually harness that, actually take it in and use it. And of course, we have to have it. There are several macromolecules that really need nitrogen in them. You know, proteins might have it, and, and nucleic acids might have it, that kind of idea. So it's important that it's there. There you go, nucleic acids and amino acids, so your proteins are going to need them. So it's important it's there. But how in the world do you go from this diatomic nitrogen in the atmosphere to something that can use it? Well, once again, thanks to the bacteria that they come out and help us. And so we have two arrays of bacteria, one that are nitrifying bacteria, getting that, that into, into things like ammonia, so finding nitrates and nitrites, those kind of compounds. And then the denitrifying bacteria that kind of go the other way and get things back into the N2 and then back out into the system. So when I worked in, in zoos and aquariums for quite a while, it was very important if I was working in aquariums, having that colonizing bacteria in the aquarium to help to, to deal with this building up of, of ammonia compounds and be able to break them back down and get them out of the system. It's very, very useful. So we have a nitrogen cycle here that I could quickly show you, of course, where you're sort of seeing that over here. This is kind of pulled out to show you the bacterial role. And you can see that down here, where you're nitrifying and denitrifying bacteria. And in this case, the nitrifying ones getting into ammonia and then finally nitrates and nitrites, of course, that's what plants can uptake. So they're not trying to uptake the N2 gas directly either. But the bacteria can get into a form that they can take in. And then something comes along and either eats the, uh, <coughs> the plant directly, or maybe you can do that. You can come in and either eat the plant directly or eat the thing that ate the plant, however it might be. And then you get nitrogen into your system, and you're able to make your proteins that you need and your DNA that you need is quite nice. And then the denitrifying, of course, getting back to that N2 that I spoke about and back into the system. <clears throat> Once again, bacteria are very useful to you. So your author's giving you examples about that, how they can do that. Here's some nitrogen fixing here that they're talking about, that they can still do that kind of process. Of course, going to ammonia here, but nitrates and nitrites are quite important. So here are some of those issues. You can see that kind of mutualism here in Anabaena doing that having some cells that are photosynthetic and some cells that are nitrogen fixing. And they kind of work together to have an overall healthy environment for themselves. They're, they're mutualists in that case. Sometimes they're not mutualists. This is one that I hope isn't affecting any of us too much. Of course, we try to deal with it regularly, like brushing our teeth or going to the dentist regularly, and that's biofilms. The formation of these bacteria on the surface of things like teeth, forming what we call dental calculus. You put the dental there, that's, that's important. Uh, giving us that plaque that builds up on our teeth, of course. And, We've all seen that to some regard. So going back to this, there you go. So you can see, obviously, here's someone's tooth. There's the gum line there. And they're showing you that right here you have that biofilm that's forming. Now with that, of course, you want to tend to this. This sort of grows and cements onto a tooth, which is why when you go to the dentist, they have to kind of like take this iron hook and chisel that thing off of you, which is always a lot of fun to do. But you can see that bacteria is growing in that mat. Uh, a side note to this is quite important, though. Bear in mind, this bacteria can grow and grow. And we know that causes gingivitis and possibly periodontic disease, this kind of issue. 
But it's even more serious than that, where if you have enough of this grow, some of these mats kind of get fragile and they can snap off. Well, you won't know. I mean, this stuff is, is microscopic. You can't see it. But you inevitably might swallow that. And as you swallow it, now you've got a bit of a problem on your hands. Because as you swallow it, it can get to the system and can go to places where you don't want and cause infections. And two of the primary infections that we might worry about here would be something like heart conditions, where it can kind of affect the cardiac system. And there's some linkage of not brushing your teeth, not having good oral health, might be having this problem, bacterial issues, leading to things like heart attacks, really quite, quite scary. And then for men, for example, and women, but men come up here a little bit because of the urinary tract infection issues. It's sometimes a bit more difficult for a male to get that. So for both males and females, though, we talk about the dental calculus, and that might snap off the, some of the bacteria might spread, get down to the urinary system, lodge in, and cause infection. So when you talk about males, for example, you might say, well, males may not pick up a UTI as easily in sexual activity than a woman. The male's urethra is much longer than a, than a female's. How's a male getting the UTI? Well, actually, it's this, that this is one of the ways in which a male can pick that up. Now, it's not to say a woman can't either, but with males being a little bit different in their UTI system, this might be this, the thing you might go back and look, as opposed to another behavior that the person's getting into. So it's very important here, and this, might, this is hurtful, of course, for you and I, to deal with, well, what's bacteria doing? Is it helping? Is it hurting? That kind of issue. We'll come back to that issue of of symbioses in a moment. So here are your main domains out there. Now in your book, of course, there's a lot more information. In my full lecture, there's a lot more information. But I just wanted to remind you there's a lot there. Some of these guys you've probably heard of before. You can see eukarya. There's just one domain, eukarya. And of course, in there, we're talking the kingdom protista. But bear in mind, that kingdom looks like it's going defunct. It's not monophyletic, so that's causing some issues. With that, of course, we also have the fungi, the animalia, and the plantae that are in that, that domain, eukarya. But look at the archaea and the bacteria. I mean, look how many domains are there. We only have one domain, and all of in that domain we have the bacteria, to be the fungi and the animalia and the plantae. I mean, all of that's in one domain. Look at these guys. They're just so variable, the bacteria that's there. And of course, some of them you've heard of. There's your cyanobacterium that you see in the domain bacteria. Something like chlamydia, oh, that's there, you know, one of the more common sexually transmitted infections that's out there. The gram positive I talked about earlier, that kind of idea. These guys are typically known as your extremophiles. There's lots of different ones out there. In this particular course, we don't need to really get into the specifics of these guys. You should take a course in bacteriology, and in there you might uh, talk a bit more about these, of course. But it's a, it's a fascinating group as well. So with the archaea, we're talking about these extremophiles that are out there, living in environments, again, that you and I would not find conducive. So your author mentions a few of them here. Halophiles, they like, uh, they like salts, that kind of idea. Thermophiles like heat. Uh, so you, you have an issue of bacteria that's in a warm environment that it grows well in that you and I would find very uncomfortable. Methanogens might be an example of that. Methanophiles, so they like, they like methane, that kind of issue. So it gives you some interesting outlets. And of course, for the extremophiles, we use them as models sometimes in astrobiology, looking to see, well, on this planet, where's an environment that a lot of life may not do well in, but bacteria do? OK, so you model that like in the, the dry areas of Antarctica, and then you say, OK, if they can live there, well, maybe it can live in a harsh area somewhere else. So you start to look at a, at a Mars area, and where on Mars might we look for life? Or you look at uh, you start to do Europa, for example, and hydrothermal vents, mind you, here might be there as well, that kind of issue. Uh, not the exact same kind of setup, but a similar situation. And you might talk about uh, Titan, a satellite that's uh, uh, from Saturn that, that they might go in and have an issue. And of course, there's methane there, we think. So it, we, we use that as a model to say what, what else might be out there. Again, amazing how they can live in these very harsh environments. So as I was saying in the beginning, it kind of sucks when we get sick, but, but we got to remember that they're out there doing their job. They're not out there to necessarily hurt us. They're just trying to, to do what they need to do to survive. And this is right. That role of being a decomp decomposer, like the fungi, having a primary role like that, very important to us, recycling your nutrients. And of course, in, in the ecological side, we like to remind ourselves of that, where we have a phrase that we haven't gotten to ecology yet, but you should never forget, that nutrient cycle and energy flows. And so we need those nutrient cycle, like I showed you in the nitrogen cycle. We need those things to keep going. And bacteria helping us out there, and Campbell's reminding that. If we didn't have bacteria helping us, maybe we didn't have fungi helping us, we would have some issues out there. So there's that recycling that they do, getting that decomp decomposer job to be out there. And they really do help out. They help out a lot of organisms. Here he's noting to you that they can help out plant growth, help you get nutrients in them. So you get these like bacterial nodules that can, can grow on roots of plants and help these plants out. 
And so, well, I have a, there you go, I have an example of that. Here's some nitrogen nodules that you can see on the roots, uh, in this case, a pea plant that's out there. So again, it's, it's absolutely fascinating to see these combinations that you see with bacteria and how they do their job, how they do the recycling, how they help the planet keep the nutrients flowing again or recycling again. It's really, again, very important, the roles. No fun when we get sick. We have to remember there's so much more to bacteria than just the issue of, well, they, they hurt you. They, they were decomposing you, for example. For the symbioses, now bear in mind, we haven't formally talked about symbionts, but there's a lot of symbiosis types out there that we could talk about. These are just biological relationships that are there. Some are useful, like helpful to both, some hurt some. Some are neutral again, maybe one benefits and one doesn't benefit. There's a lot of relationships, these close relationships that are there. This is not all inclusive. This is not considering her, um, herbivory, nor is it including uh, facilitation. But these are the main ones. It's often noted as a plus minus system. You can see why we're using pluses and minuses, that kind of idea, kind of direct of us. Now, mutualism is thought to be like the only symbiosis sometime, and that's not true. We're just talking about associations. So, mutualism notice that we have a plus plus. That means both benefits the host and the thing and are on the host kind of idea. <coughs> Excuse me. They both benefit here. Commensalism, one benefits, one gets nothing out of it. It's neither help, neither hurt, that kind of idea. Parasitism, obviously, one is benefiting and one's getting hurt, that kind of issue. So if you have a, a bacterium in you that's hurting you, you might say, oh my gosh, I got like a pathogen that's, that's hurting me. Now with parasitism, of course, we have endo and ectoparasites. So you have something on you that's hurting you, you have something in you that's hurting you, that kind of idea. Now here, they're showing you a fish that has bacteria in its tissues. And in this case, the bacteria is helping the fish out. It, it's, it's glowing. This is known as bioluminescence. So in that case, it helps the fish, in this case, maybe attract a, a mate or attract prey, that kind of idea, so the fish can feed a little bit easier. In return, the bacteria gets like a happy home to live in and maybe some, some free food, that kind of idea. So that would be an example of, of mutualism, both benefiting in that case. And we have quite a few examples of bioluminescence. And with the bioluminescence, we often see this sort of in, the, in the aquatic system, like a marine system, at a little bit lower depth, so you start getting into you know, the, the aphotic zone of the epipelagic down into the mesopelagic and, you know, certainly you go down into the bathypelagic, that kind of idea. And you, you start seeing this, hey, I need to attract somebody kind of idea, whether it's mating or food again. So a lot of organisms, I, I've seen numbers up to like 90% of these organisms actually use this kind of embedded in the tissue bacteria to, to glow, to bioluminesce and to, to attract either prey or mates. So I wanted to give you an example of that. So there is sunlight. Turn off the submersible headlights and you see a pyrotechnic display outside. These lights are created by animals. This is bioluminescence. A deep sea anglerfish flashes in the dark. Light is generated by bacteria that live permanently inside the lure, which attracts prey to these murderous teeth. There are all sorts of lures out in the darkness. Sound. 
So there you go, kind of an example of how bioluminescent work, having that bacteria embedded in the tissues and now working with the fish to do what needs to be done. For some harmful bacteria out there, again, there could be several that, that hurt us and other organisms, pathogens. Bear in mind that word pathogens, something that's pathogenic, that doesn't necessarily mean it's going to cause disease. That just means that it causes illness of some kind. Now, granted, a pathogen could lead to disease, but, but not necessarily. It's just causing illnesses. And there are, there are quite that are, that are pathogenic out there. There's some that are and some that are, that are helpful. There's all sorts of things that happen out there. I already noted this one, that inside of us we have things living in or on us, that kind of idea. So here's inside, of course. I think I noted E. coli to you, that if you get the right kind of E. coli in the right place, it helps you produce vitamin K. Bear in mind by yourself, the only vitamin that we have the ability to make is vitamin D, but in this case, vitamin K. And the bacteria, in, in return, get a home to live in and free food, that kind of idea. It works out well for everybody. And then things that hurt you. Your author notes Lyme disease. Definitely, we're here in Florida. And in Florida, my, we have ticks. I've seen some lovely ones out there. So you might have an issue with that. And notice the bacterium that's carried in the ticks can cause the actual infection in this case. So there you go. There's some lovely little buggers for you. And you can see that these guys might be causing a problem. And here's what it looks like if you get Lyme disease. You can see this is somebody's back. So the shoulders are up in here. And you can see the size of that that sore that's kind of opened up to this rash that, that's happened. And of course, he's got another one up there. So it can really hurt the system if this comes in. You need to be careful about that. I've gone hiking before here in Florida and other places, and I have to be kind of worried about that. We have others that can cause you to become sick directly, and some that might kind of leave the area, they're not there anymore, and then cause you to get sick. So here's one that creates an exotoxin, in this case, actually secreting out what can end up causing you harm. Uh, Clostridium botulinum, this kind of organism, actually doesn't even have to be there. It just releases the toxin. And as it releases the toxin, you come by and then you eat the food. And now you ingest the toxin and you get terribly sick, that kind of idea. So they don't have to be present. They're not there. But they've left the toxin behind. And now you get sick. Got to be careful. And then endotoxins. Notice here the bacteria is dying in that case. So you might talk about Bacillus anthracis, so anthrax. And in that case, it's kind of an intriguing one. Your immune system can actually probably deal with a bacterial infection. But by the time it charges and starts to kill off the bacterium, the bacterium's dying. It's being killed, but it's had time to mature the toxin. So as it dies, it releases the toxin, and the toxin ends up killing you. It's quite frightening, but, but it's just how this happens to work. And then some final use of bacteria. And you know, some things are out there like biotech that you can work with and help things. So you might talk about, say, using bacteria to make uh, maybe bovine growth hormone to help make, get cows to make excess milk. And humans, interestingly, of course, still drink milk for a lot of us throughout our life. And you've got to get cows to make all that stuff. Or you might have bacterium that's being helpful to produce out what we need for insulin so that we can collect that and actually help diabetics out. There's, of course, a lot that you can do with that. And then even bioremediation, you know, with my work in ecology, having organisms that help you out, maybe with like an oil spill, so deal with oils can be quite useful. So there's research going into, well, OK, if you have an oil spill, uh, there's obviously a lot of environmental damage that could come out of this. What can we do quickly to help with, a, with the, the hydrocarbons being released? And we do know that bacteria have the ability to naturally break down hydrocarbons. So another question is, well, can we use that? Can we actually get the bacterium to help us with an oil spill, yes or no? So like anything else, scientists have to study that and see if it actually is possible. So again, there's a lot that you can do. There's, of course, antibiotics and hormones that you can do quite a bit. So I wanted to leave you then with one last video to kind of highlight some of this. And this is oil uh, degradation that's out there, being able to break down oils potentially with bacteria. Crude oil is constantly seeping from sites on the ocean floor. Natural seepage leaves large amounts of oil in the world's oceans. Even before the Deepwater Horizon oil disaster in the Gulf of Mexico, an estimated 160,000 tons of oil escaped every year. The heavier part of it sinks to the seabed, where it's broken down by bacteria. They live off substances in the oil, substances that are toxic for animals and humans. Marine researchers in Bremen are trying to find out how the bacteria break down the poisonous compounds. What new substances are produced? Which components disperse in the water? And what stays behind? What's left is a very hard, asphalt-like substance. This hard substance is used by deep-sea animals as a substrate. Even corals can ultimately colonize it. But aren't these asphalt clumps toxic? Most of the toxic substances have been degraded out of the asphalt. Bacteria on the ocean surface can break down the light components of the oil. 
In fact, they do so very rapidly. The problem is that their biodegrading activity removes oxygen from the water, turning whole sections of the oceans into environments hostile to life. The vast bacteria with oxygen available to break down the oil are the important ones that clean up after an oil spill. But the biggest amounts of oil are broken down under situations where no oxygen is available. We want to know what kinds of microorganisms can do that and what kind of diversity there is. Very little is known about these bacteria that live in the remains of oil on the sea floor. But that is set to change. The scientists have been collecting samples from around the world. In the Gulf of Mexico, they sent a diving robot down 3,000 meters to pick up some relics of oil remnants, along with the bacteria that break down the oil. The chemical transformations take place under extreme conditions. There's no sunlight down there. The water temperature is 2 degrees Celsius, and the pressure is enormous. The samples turn out to exhibit remarkable diversity. Many types of bacteria break down the oil simultaneously. It's a complex substance made up of as many as 2,000 different compounds. To study these oil chompers more closely, the biologists have set up a culture. So far, only a few species have been successfully cultured. The scientists can study how the biodegradation is affected by environmental influences such as salt content and water temperature, the presence of nutrients, or the pressure. Some bacteria specialize in particular substances, others eat their way through a range of compounds. But the scientists say it would make little sense to try to produce them in large quantities. As far as we know, in the case of oil spills in the ocean, the microorganisms that live there are adapted to the conditions of their environment. So they will always work more rapidly and in a more sustainable way to break down the oil than bacteria that have been cultured in a lab. That means the residue of an oil catastrophe will eventually vanish, but it's still unclear how long nature will need to transform it into non-hazardous asphalt. Some researchers say the process could take thousands of years. So again, quite fascinating what bacteria have the ability to do. Well, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, these little videos can be kind of long, but there's a lot to talk about here, and of course, to bring in some extra material to show you. If you have any questions, of course, let me know. Feel free to ask anything. I'll do my best to help you out. Thank you very much for everything.